With me now and throughout the show, reacting to the day's big stories and looking at tomorrow's headlines, my fabulous panel, very excited. We have newbie, Letis Bromovsky, a former Lib Dem MP, Lembit Opic, and financial and business journalist, Jasmine Bertels. Great to have you all here. Um, Jasmine, can I get your reaction to the resurfacing of the lesser spotted Matt Hancock? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I could not agree more with everything you have just said. I couldn't believe that he could show his face, let alone say anything, and, and everything that he was saying was wrong, was just out and out, unpleasantly, pointlessly wrong. And I have to wonder who and what is behind him. Who's given him enough of an incentive, let's say, to do this, to put his name to that utter drivel? Yeah, well, I think many will echo that view. Uh, Lembit, what's your view about this? You've uh, been in the corridors of power, a, a long-serving and very high-profile Lib Dem. Um, what do you make of his career and why he's attempting to come back now? I don't agree with Jasmine. <laughs> or you, actually, Mark, in one way. Even if you disagree with what he said, the idea that his personal life is a reason for him not to be able to express these views, even if you disagree with them, uh, is completely ridiculous. This is the real frustration. I've said this before on your show that I have. People mix up a professional performance with a personal performance. And while many of us may have found what he did interesting, I don't judge him for that. Now, I'm very, very willing to have some sympathy with what you've said and actually with what Jasmine has said about what he said today, mm -hmm. but I totally disagree with the fact that he should just clear off from public life. Now, I declare an interest. I've been through that mill in some way. You've uh, got the T-shirts. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, and I'm still selling them if anybody wants to buy one. <laughs> and in that sense, I have some sympathy with him because I think that we've got all this stuff mixed up because of the media, you, the media, who won't separate the two things. So, yes, sure, totally disagree with him if you want to, but don't play the man just because he wants to be in public life. Uh, but I wonder whether uh, we're actually misinterpreting the criticism of Matt Hancock because we might have made a few jokes at his expense in terms of the, uh, the, the corridor clinch. Uh, but actually, what he did, as played out on that yeah. CCTV footage then bit, was to discard and break the rules that he was forcing on the rest of us. Yes, it was hypocritical. And I very much doubt that whether there's a soul in this country who could be prosecuted, because if you're prosecuted for breaking the bubble rules, for example, or other rules, all you have to do is say, well, reasonable deniability, the man who introduced these mm. broke them, so I didn't think they counted anymore. Mm. And secondly, he would have to be prosecuted too. So in that sense, I completely agree with you. Politically, what you've said, what Jasmine said, uh, is on the money. But when it comes to the idea that he hasn't got the right to say these things, even if we object to them, that's just way out of order. Let Matt Hancock has his, have his say. And uh, I am actually even a bit sceptical about his, his vitriolic attack on anti-vaxxers. It's much better to have the debate rather than just dismiss them out of hand. Mm. But he's got the right to have this discussion. He's got the right to have this point of view. And I do feel that he's been pushed out. And I felt that happened to me a little bit, just because of my, it wasn't exactly a personal or private life, because it was written all over the press. But that wasn't a reason to judge what I said politically. And I think that the two things are, whatever you say, Mark, they're getting mixed up again. Well, do you think Matt Hancock should still be health secretary then, that he should have apologised for his extramarital affair and stayed in post? It's not the fact he had an extramarital affair. It's the fact he broke the lockdown rules. And that was a resignation issue. And he's paid that price. It's a long way back to come from there, if he can even do it. So, no, he shouldn't. He couldn't be health secretary. But he does have the right to comment. But, Lembert, you, you say that, uh, you know, he should be allowed to have the discussion. That's the whole point. There is no discussion. You know, what he's spouting there is what is across all of the media, well, apart from here, um, all of the newspapers is just one message at all times. There's, there's barely the, a scintilla of anything that goes opposite to it. We need a discussion and we're not being allowed it. Just one sentence on that. Uh, you're actually right. At the risk of sounding sycophantic, Mark, <laughs> GB News is the one place mm. we can say these things. Seriously. And there is this tyranny of the majority, this conformism, which I loathe, actually. I really loathe it. Uh, but, the, but that's not a good enough reason to say that Matt Hancock shouldn't express his view. We should have more opportunity to express mm -hmm. the view, otherwise, other than just needing living on Ireland GB News to be the one place we can say these things. Well, yes, and we like a good debate lettuce on this show and on this network, and it is all about the competition of ideas. And actually, in defence of Matt Hancock, 
the vast majority of the public would support what he wrote today in the Mail on Sunday, that those who have not had the vaccine are irresponsible and selfish. No, I definitely disagree with that. Um, I think that having the vaccine is a choice and a right that you decide, like any other medical procedure. Um, I think that I'm not opposed to getting the vaccine. I think people should be vaccinated. But ultimately, it comes down to your own right and your own choice. 90% of this country has at least had one dose of the vaccine. You know, we are in the vast majority of being vaccinated. And I definitely do not think that these um, anti-vaxxers are the greatest threat to us right now. However, uh, the public would back his message, wouldn't they, uh, Lettuce? And that's the important thing that actually, uh, I suspect if you ask people whether we should mandate vaccines, probably a majority would say yes. I, I don't know about mandating them, but I definitely don't think that there should be any sort of coercive language. I don't think mm. those that are unvaccinated should be branded as selfish or stupid or be limited in any way in this sort of daily life. Um, like I said, I'm pro-vaccine, mm. but I think that that should be a choice and not a mandate at all. And Lettuce, what was happening today, reading between the lines, was Matt Hancock pushing the vaccine or was he pushing his career? I mean, I'm sure he was pushing his career. Like you said, I think it's rather shameless. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely think that um, both of his, what he did with his aid and the hypocrisy of it were definitely linked. I don't think they can be separated, um, which is why I think, um, yeah, no, I think he, he, should, he should run away and this shouldn't be something he should be coming back from just yet. He should be sort of ashamed of what he's done. It showed the hypocrisy. He was the Minister of Health and he was putting forward um, a, a policy to state that we should be distancing from each other and he was caught on camera in the act and um, yeah I think he should be ashamed of that. And Lettuce that's a video none of us will ever unsee. <laughs> Definitely not. Do you think he should have resigned his seat Lettuce? Uh, yeah, I, de I'm, I think he should have definitely resigned his seat. Like I said, the really? Is that not too far? No, definitely not. Not when you are in that position. People are following you. People are meant. You're meant to be upholding the mm. utmost of uh, what you're putting forward. Um, and he was not doing that at all. Lembit. I just don't agree with you on that last point, Lettuce. Uh, there's a phrase that comes from the Northern Ireland peace process I was involved in. Just because you've got a past doesn't mean you can't have a future. He, he lost his job as cabinet minister. I think it's very unlikely he'll get back to the cabinet again. But to, to lose his entire career on, on a, an act of passion, uh, in affairs of the heart, all advice is useless. I don't think that's a good enough reason. But the hypocrisy, I totally agree with Jasmine and also with Lettuce about this, because, because you cannot do a job when you've told the whole country to stay at home mm -hmm. and then you're in a romantic bubble, let's call it that. Uh, and let's just remember the, whole, the two families involved in this and the children involved in this yeah. as well. Yeah. They're the real victims here. Mm. And what I don't like is the fact that these things are kind of sneakily brought together. Mm. Hypocrisy, good point. I just totally agree with that. But it's not a resignation issue from Parliament. He's already paid the price. And every time he walks into a bar, everyone says, oh, that's, that's, um, mm. that's handy Matt. <laughs> um, I mean, Jasmine, mm. playing devil's advocate, mm. The message from Matt Hancock is that he's encouraging people to have the vaccine and he's got a point given the fact that the vaccine appears very effective at reducing hospitalizations and deaths. So what's not to like? Is it though? I, you know, the, the figures are so messed up. In fact, figures that I've seen um, show that the people who have had the vaccine actually are the ones with the, the, the more, more problems. Mm. Um, this is coming out over and over. I mean, if you just look at, for example, Israel, the most vaccinated country in the world, um, they're now not allowed in Sweden and Portugal. Mm. You know, they have rising cases. In fact, wherever you have a big rollout of the vaccine, you have a big rollout of cases. So I, I really take issue with that, that whole idea. But is, is, is that because the vaccine isn't really there to stop transmission in its tracks, but it's there to reduce severe illness. That does seem to be it, yes. Uh, I mean, the, we keep being told, the NHS, the government keeps saying, of course, it's not going to stop you getting it, it's not going to stop you transmitting it, but we still want you to have a vaccine passport. We still want you to show mm. that you've yeah. had it for some reason. And the only reason that I can see is so that it will reduce symptoms. That's the only one. So that's fine for the person who's having it. 
but it does not affect everybody around them. So I, I simply don't understand the idea that everybody has to have it or, you know, this group of people has to have it in order to, to save that group of people. It doesn't. It simply doesn't. Um, my panel are with me for the full three hours. Very excited tonight. Lettuce Bromovsky, former Lib Dem MP at Lembit OPIC and financial and business journalist Jasmine Bertels. Now, Lembit given the fact that these missions cost millions. It's not very accessible, is it? I love this. I declare an interest. I yes, am the do. chair of the Parliament of Ascardia, the world's first space nation, as you may remember. Yes. And uh, this is all about making uh, space accessible for the many, not the few. You see what I did there? <laughs> and we're literally Nicely talking done. about getting communities of, not scientists, ISS, International Space Station is great, mm. but it's not really a community of ordinary people. Uh, we want to have real people, ordinary folks, living up there permanently. So the first child to be born in space should be an Ascardian and the first permanent human space habitation. The brainchild of Dr. Igor Ashabeli mm. is a billionaire who really believes in exactly what you've just been talking about. Mm. Now, to me, this is exciting because this begins to open up space in the same way that after the pioneering early days of, of, of aviation, mm. now just about anyone, when they're allowed to with COVID restrictions, <laughs> can go on holiday. Yeah. So to me, this was an exciting thing. One small step for man, one giant mm -hmm. leap for profiteering as, as well, well yeah. as opening Where, where would community. Escardia, this, uh, this wonderful new territory, uh, where would it be? Where, what's the location of it? Uh, well, it'll be in orbit. Low Earth orbit is the first place. So what does that mean? It's just sort of just just well, what does, what does that mean? But Ascardia is named after the legendary uh, city of the gods uh, from ancient mythology. And what we want to do is a natural next step, however otherworldly it sounds literally. We have to reach out from Earth. We either travel or die. Eventually, there's going to be a really bad thing that will happen on the Earth. I don't mean the pandemic, mm. an asteroid impact or something. If we don't... And climate change. Well... Temptingly you, so there. You know, sure. my, <laughs> you know my scepticism about so that. Sure. But, but actually, it, 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 it could be that. The reality is we have to keep moving, have to keep travelling. So Asgardia says, let's build a space community. And anyone can join. Uh, it's 100 euros a year to be a resident of Ascardia, and then you can join the parliament and everything that goes with it. I know I'm getting excited. This so wait a minute, you just have to help me with the science of it. That It would be beyond the Earth's orbit. No, well, so no, you're in a zero gravity setting? What it means setting? is you'll be up there somewhere like these guys went. The furthest, these people went further than anyone has been from the Earth since the Apollo mm. missions, 360 miles. We'll be up there somewhere. And we'll have big space stations. It's not like for six people, but 600 or maybe 6,000 people. So it'd be like a, a big housing estate in, in the sky. Sort of going all round. It would be just like Elephant and Castle <laughs> right. in the sky, but you couldn't open the windows and there won't be any backyard. What? So okay. it is like that. You haven't been there. I'm surprised that you weren't on this the SpaceX. What happened? Why, why weren't you there? Yeah. I didn't know there was an application. Oh, right. That's just the only reason. <laughs> is, is the idea of I would have space gone. exploration, I mean, we know that there have been scientific uh, developments including GPS and other technologies but uh, is it also to do with the idea that the earth is finite and we yeah. need a plan B? There is an actual environmental agenda here as well which is we have to go elsewhere because if we're going to spend the next million years on the earth we're going to run out of stuff mm. and it's not just that it would be like never having gone th across the high seas, Columbus never ha ma having made his trips and so on. Well, that's right. Th thousands of years ago, the idea of travelling from Europe to Africa would have been fantasy. Yeah. And, who, and, and in 1903, when the Wright brothers made their first flight, who would have thought that you could have 550 or 600 people on a single aircraft? Mm -hmm. So, so this is all, Ascardia is all about genuinely creating a sustainable society. It's the world's first successful digital democracy, so I am sort of in politics again, as chair of the party. <laughs> sort of. No political parties, there, no Liberal Democrat <laughs> party. Uh, not that I'm bitter. Um, and, and also, the other thing is, it, it's inspirational, because we're doing something that no one else has done, create a real community there. So, I expect to see you all joining. Well, 100 euros a year. Do you, do you yeah. care about space? Well, y yes and no. I mean, I must admit, the, the idea of going up there, no, that, that doesn't interest me. But, but in theory, I like it. And I like what you're, you're saying. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll 
I'll join. I'll Don't. join. I'll have a passport. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be a member of that community. I'll, you know, down on the ground. <laughs> oh, I would definitely have to disagree with you there. I would be so keen to go into space. Right now, it's a little out of my price range, but hopefully one day I'll make yeah. it up there. It's become a more attractive proposition in the last year and a half, hasn't it? Yeah, yes. definitely. To escape definitely. <laughs> Can't go to France, but you can go to space. Yes. It will be especially good if there's no Wi-Fi up there. That <laughs> you know, really yes. would be a holiday. Do you know we're closer to orbit than we are to Paris? Because, yes, yeah, space begins at 62 kilometres. Uh, sorry, 62 miles, 100 kilometres. After that, you're technically in space. And oh, so don't have these, to go too far. Yeah, these guys were going at 360 miles. So we in the studio are actually closer to their orbit than we are to Edinburgh. So ultimately, wow. there'll be a sort of Euro star to the stars. Yeah. Then. Actually, yeah. funnily enough, I was speaking to a guy called Michael Lane yesterday, big, very nerdy name drop coming up now, who was responsible for NASA's project to create a space elevator, a lift. <laughs> literally going from the Earth into space. That's Boris Johnson brilliant. will be all over that like a rash. Yes. Yeah, he gets stuck yeah. halfway up, of course. <laughs> he likes he? a bridge, but yeah, he <laughs> gets stuck up it, definitely. Yes. Well, look, let's talk about Boris, because uh, we had the big reshuffle this week. Michael Gove was one of the big winners, as he was given the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. But it's also now, the whole department has been renamed the Department for Leveling Up. <laughs> housing and communities, underlining its central role in delivering the government's agenda. The PM said this government is committed to uniting and levelling up every part of the UK. And I'm determined that as we build back better from the pandemic, we are geared up with the teams and expertise to deliver on that promise. Uh, Lettuce, levelling up, is it going to happen or is it a political myth? I mean, I think there's definitely an important point to make here about, you know, whether they're serious about it mm. and whether they'll actually be able to enact it in the end. Um, I think from what we've seen of, you know, there's a new minister for it. We've got a new name for the department. They've brought in a new um, uh, task force for levelling up, yeah. headed by a former uh, Bank of England chief economist. So they're definitely beefing up to uh, enact this levelling up agenda. Um, and I think their white paper on the levelling up they bring out next month will uh, definitely show the direction. And hopefully they'll be able to focus in on some key areas and really So see. the political will is there, but yes. off the back of the biggest recession in 300 years, 2.1 yeah. trillion quid's worth of national debt, uh, the, the whole the essence of levelling up is money. And really, is there the money now to deliver on this policy? Well, whether there is the money or not, I think the more important question of this should be about the management of it. Mm. Um, and really, I hope to see from this a bit of devolved power. Mm. Um, we saw from Gordon, Brown, uh, Gordon Brown's think tank that said that um, people were five times more likely to um, support their, uh, believe that their mayor would be able to support them in levelling up rather than their MP. Um, and this is something we've definitely seen in Manchester with Andy Burnham over recently. You know, mm. he's had a massive impact on the area. Um, and I really hope there'll be some level of, uh, lev of uh, devolved power mm. in this situation mm. um, to spend the money more wisely. Jasmine, you're a financial mm. journalist, an expert on the economy. <laughs> Do you think that levelling up is a realistic goal? Oh, well, I think it's, it's a very nice goal and, you know, good for them for thinking about it. But I must admit, when I, when I just saw the name, I'm trying not to be cynical. I'm really trying not to be <laughs> cynical, but I sort of thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, seriously, you honestly think that we're going to believe? You honestly think that's going to happen? It it, it just looks like something that's that's there to fail. I, I mean, I'm sorry to say mm. it, but I, I just feel that it probably will. I'm hoping that it won't. But yeah, I think we, we at the moment, we're firefighting. I think the government is mm. firefighting and probably will be for a while. So it, it's a nice to have, but I, I do question whether it's going to happen. Well, staying on, on the economy apart. and financial matters, which mm. is your area of expertise, I just feel that we're living in a parallel universe because mm. the government are pretending or giving the impression that they can keep their manifesto pledges from December 2019, <laughs> before the pandemic, yes. before shutting the economy down for a year and a half, exactly. before yes. borrowing 34 billion quid for track and trace. At least, yes. Yeah, at yes. least, if, and the rest. Yeah, so, and the rest, yeah. So do you think that it, politicians have a duty of care uh, not just to balance the books, but also to manage the public's expectations about what is possible now. Well, yeah, true. I mean, they, they have already started, as, as you know, with the triple lock, mm. with the, the state pension. Um, they've actually taken out a bit of the triple. Um, so, so that the state pension doesn't go up by 8% as it would be doing next, mm. next April. It won't be doing that now. So they have already started to go, yeah, you know, we promised that. Yeah, sorry, it's not happening. And, of course, the national insurance hike. 
Yeah. Is this tinkering around the edges or not? I mean, do we need to have a grown-up conversation about how much this country can actually afford to spend going forward? Yeah, we do. And I'd also like to have a grown-up com grown mm. conversation about how we're going to get the money in. Because many people are saying, actually, that the best way to claw back that cash through tax, which is basically the way it's going to happen, mm. is to grow the economy. So, you yeah. know, yeah. the more you have a grown economy, mm. the, the more tax you get back. And frankly, that does sound to me like the, frankly, less, least painful way to do it, apart yeah. from anything else. Len Bitt, what's your view on levelling up? I've only got one thing to add to what my colleagues here say. Let's just not beat around the bush. Let's call it the Department for Woke, because that's all it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I tell you what, damning, a damning assessment <laughs> from a man who knows. He has, yeah. of course, had a long career in politics, but he's now with us as a broadcaster and commentator. And I'll get my panel's views on lots more stories after 11. Len Bitt given the fact that these missions cost millions. It's not very accessible, is it? I love this. I declare an interest. I yes, am the do. chair of the Parliament of Ascardia, the world's first space nation, as you may remember. Yes. And uh, this is all about making uh, space accessible for the many, not the few. You see what I did there? <laughs> and we're literally Nicely talking done. about getting communities of, not scientists, ISS, International Space Station is great, mm. but it's not really a community of ordinary people. Uh, we want to have real people, ordinary folks, living up there permanently, so the first child to be born in space should be an Ascardian, and the first permanent human space habitation. The brainchild of Dr. Igor Asher Bailey mm. is a billionaire who really believes in exactly what you've just been talking about. Mm. Now, to me, this is exciting because this begins to open up space in the same way that after the pioneering early days of, of, of aviation, mm. now just about anyone, when they're allowed to with COVID restrictions, <laughs> can go on holiday. Yeah. So to me, this was an exciting thing. One small step for man, one giant mm -hmm. leap for profiteering as, as well, well yeah. as opening Where, where would community. Escardia, this, uh, this wonderful new territory, uh, where would it be? Where, what's the location of it? Uh, well, it'll be in orbit. Low Earth orbit is the first place. So what does that mean? It's just sort of just... just well, what does, what does that mean? But Ascardia is named after the legendary uh, city of the gods uh, from ancient mythology. And what we want to do is a natural next step, however otherworldly it sounds literally. We have to reach out from Earth. We either travel or die. Eventually, there's going to be a really bad thing that will happen on the Earth. I don't mean the pandemic, mm. an asteroid impact or something. If we don't... And climate change. Well... You, me there. So you, know sure. my, <laughs> you know my scepticism about so sure. that, but, but actually it, 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 it could be that. The reality is we have to keep moving, have to keep travelling. So Asgardia says, let's build a space community and anyone can join. Uh, it's 100 euros a year to be a resident of Ascardia, and then you can join the parliament and everything that goes with it. I know I'm getting excited. This so wait a minute, you just have to help me with the science of it. That It would be beyond the Earth's orbit. No, well, so no, you're in a zero gravity setting? What it means setting? is you'll be up there somewhere like these guys went. The furthest, these people went further than anyone has been from the Earth since the Apollo mm. missions, 360 miles. We'll be up there somewhere. And we'll have big space stations. It's not like for six people, but 600 or maybe 6,000 people. So it'd be like a, a big housing estate in, in the sky. Sort of going all round. <laughs> it would be just like Elephant and Castle <laughs> right. in the sky, but you couldn't open the windows and there won't be any backyard. What? So okay. it is like that. You haven't been there. I'm surprised that you weren't on this the SpaceX. What happened? Why, why weren't you there? Yeah. I didn't know there was an application. Oh, right. That's the only reason. <laughs> is, is the idea of I would have space gone. exploration, I mean, we know that there have been scientific uh, developments including GPS and other technologies but uh, is it also to do with the idea that the earth is finite and we yeah. need a plan B? There is an actual environmental agenda here as well which is we have to go elsewhere because if we're going to spend the next million years on the earth we're going to run out of stuff mm. and it's not just that it would be like never having gone across the high seas, Columbus never ha having made his trips and so on. Well, that's right. Th thousands of years ago, the idea of travelling from Europe to Africa would have been fantasy. Yeah. And, who, and, and in 1903, when the Wright brothers made their first flight, who would have thought that you could have 550 or 600 people on a single aircraft? Mm -hmm. So, so this is all, Ascardia is all about genuinely creating a sustainable society. It's the world's first successful digital democracy, so I am sort of in politics again, as chair of the party. <laughs> sort of. No political parties, there, no Liberal Democrat <laughs> party. Uh, not that I'm bitter. Um, and, and also, the other thing is, it, it's inspirational, because we're doing something that no one else has done, create a real community there. So, 
I expect to see you all join. Well, 100 euros a year. Do you, do you yeah. care about space? Well, y yes and no. I mean, I must admit, the, the idea of going up there, no, that, that doesn't interest me. But but in theory, I like it. And I like what you're, you're saying. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll join. I'll Ooh. join. I'll have a passport. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be a member of that community, I'll, you know, down on the ground. <laughs> oh, I would definitely have to disagree with you there. I would be so keen to go into space. Right now, it's a little out of my price range, but hopefully one day I'll make yeah. it up there. It's become a more attractive proposition in the last year and a half, hasn't it? Yeah, yes. definitely. To escape definitely. <laughs> Can't go to France, but you can go to space. Yes. It will be especially good if there's no Wi-Fi up there. That you know, really yes. would be a holiday. Do you know we're closer to orbit than we are to Paris? Because, yes, yeah, space begins at 62 kilometres. Uh, sorry, 62 miles, 100 kilometres. After that, you're technically in space. And yeah, so don't have these, to go too far. Yeah, these guys were going at 360 miles. So we in the studio are actually closer to their orbit than we are to Edinburgh. So ultimately, wow. there'll be a sort of Eurostar to the stars. Yeah. Then. Actually, yeah. funnily enough, I was speaking to a guy called Michael Lane yesterday, big, very nerdy name drop coming up now, who was responsible for NASA's project to create a space elevator, a lift. <laughs> literally going from the Earth into space. That's Boris brilliant. Johnson will be all over that like a rash. Yes. Yeah, he gets stuck yeah. halfway up, of course. <laughs> he likes he? a bridge, but yeah, he <laughs> gets stuck up it, definitely. Yes. Well, look, let's talk about Boris, because uh, we had the big reshuffle this week. Michael Gove was one of the big winners as he was given the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. But it's also now, the whole department has been renamed the Department for Leveling Up oh, Housing and Communities, underlining its central role in delivering the government's agenda. The PM said this government is committed to uniting and levelling up every part of the UK. And I'm determined that as we build back better from the pandemic, we are geared up with the teams and expertise to deliver on that promise. Uh, lettuce, levelling up, is it going to happen or is it a political myth? I mean, I think there's definitely an important point to make here about, you know, whether they're serious about it mm. and whether they'll actually be able to enact it in the end. Um, I think from what we've seen of, you know, there's a new minister for it. We've got a new name for the department. They've brought in a new um, uh, task force for levelling up, yeah. headed by a former uh, Bank of England chief economist. So they're definitely beefing up to uh, enact this levelling up agenda. Um, and I think their white paper on levelling up they bring out next month will uh, definitely show the direction. And hopefully they'll be able to focus in on some key areas and really So see. the political will is there, but yes. off the back of the biggest recession in 300 years, 2.1 yeah. trillion quid's worth of national debt, uh, the, the whole the essence of levelling up is money. And really, is there the money now to deliver on this policy? Well, whether there is the money or not, I think the more important question of this should be about the management of it. Mm. Um, and really, I hope to see from this a bit of devolved power. Mm. Um, we saw from Gordon, Brown, uh, Gordon Brown's think tank that said that um, people were five times more likely to um, support their, uh, believe that their mayor would be able to support them in levelling up rather than their MP. Um, and this is something we've definitely seen in Manchester with Andy Burnham over recently. You know, mm. he's had a massive impact on the area. Um, and I really hope there'll be some level of, uh, lev of uh, devolved power mm. in this situation mm. um, to spend the money more wisely. Jasmine, you're a financial mm. journalist, an expert on the economy. <laughs> Do you think that levelling up is a realistic goal? Oh, well, I think it's, it's a very nice goal and, you know, good for them for thinking about it. But I must admit, when I, when I just saw the name, I'm trying not to be cynical. I'm really trying not to be <laughs> cynical, but I sort of thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, seriously, you honestly think that we're going to believe it? You honestly think that's going to happen? It, it, it just looks like something that's, that's there to fail. I, I mean, I'm sorry to say mm. it, but I, I just feel that it probably will. I'm hoping that it won't. But yeah, I think we, we at the moment, we're firefighting. I think the government is mm. firefighting and probably will be for a while. So it, it's a nice to have, but I, I do question whether it's going to happen. Well, staying on, on the economy apart. and financial matters, which mm. is your area of expertise, I just feel that we're living in a parallel universe universe because mm. the government are pretending or giving the impression that they can keep their manifesto pledges from December 2019 <laughs> before the pandemic, yes. before shutting the economy down for a year and a half, exactly. before yes. borrowing 34 billion quid for track and trace. At least, yes. Yeah, at yes. least, if and the rest. Yeah, so, and the rest, yeah. So do you think that it, politicians have a duty of care 
uh, not just to balance the books, but also to manage the public's expectations about what is possible now. Well, yeah, true. I mean, they, they have already started, as, as you know, with the triple lock, mm. with the, the state pension. Um, they've actually taken out a bit of the triple um, so, so that the state pension doesn't go up by 8% as it would be doing next, next April. It won't be doing that now. So they have already started to go, yeah, you know, we promised that. Yeah, sorry, it's not happening. And, of course, the national insurance hike. Yes. Is this tinkering around the edges or not? I mean, do we need to have a grown-up conversation about how much this country can actually afford to spend going forward? Yeah, we do. And I'd also like to have a grown-up com grown mm. conversation about how we're going to get the money in. Because many people are saying, actually, that the best way to claw back that cash through tax, which is basically the way it's going to happen, mm. is to grow the economy. So, you yeah. know, yeah. the more you have a grown economy, mm. the, the more tax you get back. And frankly, that does sound to me like the, frankly, less, least painful way to do it, apart yeah. from anything else. Len Bitt, what's your view on levelling up? I've only got one thing to add to what my colleagues here say. Let's just not beat around the bush. Let's call it the Department for Woke, because that's all it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, damning, a damning assessment <laughs> from a man who knows. He has, yeah. of course, had a long career in politics, but he's now with us as a broadcaster and commentator. And I'll get my panel's views on lots more stories after 11. What is your preferred gadget? GB Views at GBNews.UK. Panel, have you got gadgets you couldn't live without? I feel like for me, definitely, I love my Fitbit. Oh, yeah. Being able to track my steps. It becomes, you know, sometimes a bit of an obsession, but mm. definitely something I really love now and potentially couldn't live without. How are your steps going today? Um, probably not so high because I've been sat at my desk for most of the day. Do you but want to do a couple of rounds of the studio? Yeah, maybe? probably we'll need to. I think I'm under 10,000 still, so <laughs> there's a few more to do. So you like your Fitbit. How about you? Are you a gadget man? Yeah, my good old-fashioned stopwatch, mm. which I use when I do public speaking or training. Oh, yeah. I just love the... It's just something wonderful about that stopwatch. And secondly, my garlic press. Have you got a good one? Because mine always snaps. Yeah, no, I'm obsessed. I've got about five, mm. and I'm still trying to find the perfect garlic press. So somebody out there has got a perfect garlic press. The OXO one is good. Have you used that? No, I haven't. Yeah, I don't own shares in that company. Bit of a but bug. The problem is that normally with a garlic press, the garlic gets sort of built up yeah, and yeah, stuck inside so the holes. Impossible yeah, they're impossible yeah. to clean. Yeah, they're impossible to clean. OXO one. OK, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> highly <laughs> recommended. I look forward to my freebie being sent in the post. <laughs> How about you, are you a gadget person? No noise cancelling headphones. That's uh, the best. I really, yeah. I love my noise cancelling And do you know what's really good about them? It's not only for the enjoyment of music, but you can also have them without music. Yes, <laughs> just to block out the world. It's great. Lovely. No noisy kids in the yeah. house. Uh, well, I've got a pressure cooker at home. Do you know what that is? Yes. Yeah. I grew up with Brilliant one. Technology. I definitely grew do. up with one. Mike is. Yes. Well, I'm going time. to embarrass myself by attempting <laughs> to explain the science of it. But essentially, what you do is you put, you know, whatever you're cooking, uh, into a into a pressure cooker. So, for example, you could buy like a really tough piece of meat. Uh, let's say a brisket of beef, right? Which if you just roast it, it would be very, very hard to eat and mm. enjoy. But it goes into the saucepan and then maybe an inch or two of stock. And then you close the lid and the lid's got a valve in. So as the water boils, the steam escapes and the valve closes, which creates pressure. Wow. And it means that you can cook, let's say, a chicken in a quarter of the time. Mm. Yeah. And an hour or two in the pressure cooker with that brisket and it just falls off the fork when you eat it. You need shares on that as well. Yeah, That's a brilliant description. So I do, I do. I've got to say, I love a bit of pressure cooker action. And you know what? It's very economic. You're well into... You yeah, know, the, absolutely. The, the, yeah. the home economics. Mm. And what's good about the pressure cooker, you can get one for about 20, 25 quid. Uh, kids shouldn't use them because they no. can be hazardous. They go... Pew! Yeah, I be know. careful. Yes. Uh, read the instructions. But um, it's a very economical way of cooking. Mm. And what's nice about, about the pressure cooker is you just throw everything in there. So potatoes, carrots, meat, and it's like switch it on. Easy. It's easy. Easy peasy. Well, there you go. That's what I like. But the problem with a lot of gadgets is it's not exactly clear always what they do, is it? They can be quite ambiguous to the naked eye. So we thought we would test our panel's gadget oh, knowledge no. with a game <laughs> no. of Inspect a Gadget. Oh. <laughs> Inspect a Gadget. Well done, James. Oh. <laughs> so, panel, I will show you a series of photographs of gadgets and you have to tell me what they're for, starting with this. What on earth is that? A key fob? Some sort of an it's electronic not. fob? No. And, uh, and let, me, let me remind you it's yeah. a family show. <laughs> Because I know what you like. Well, I didn't want to say that. Uh, that's my <laughs> second suggestion. Lembit's lived a life. Let's just, let's just leave so it's it not that, that either. <laughs> Definitely not. 
So it's not something that opens your car? You don't squeeze it? Yeah, it or like a, a no, tracker uh, or something? You no, I can give you a clue and tell you it's bigger than it looks. It's, it's larger than a key fob. How, how it's about the size of a hairdryer. Uh, my gosh, a weight? Nope. I have no idea. Put you out of your misery. No, it's a muscle gun. For those, oh, I still don't know what it is. <laughs> What's a muscle, muscle gun? gun yeah. Well, if you've been, if you've been sort of jogging, or, or maybe you've been in the gym and your muscles are aching, it just pummels your muscles. Does so it's it? like an electronic masseuse. I've had people to do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lembert, Lembert's going to jump on an Amazon later and get himself one. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Buy it now on eBay. Um, how about this next offering? Take a look at this. What could this be? Bullets. Ooh, bullets, yes. <laughs> they are bullets, well done. But what are they for? What do they do? Uh, shooting people? Small. No. <laughs> no. I'm from say... <laughs> No, actually, there is a clue in shooting because they're for shots. It's a whiskey ice cube bullet. Oh. You go in the freezer oh. and you just drop them in your drink. Happy day. <laughs> How about this one? Okay, we've got one more coming. What on earth is that? It looks broken. Like headphones, yeah, it does look like about. headphones, doesn't it's it? That's going to be a fat remover. There's going to be a shaky remover. fat remover <laughs> thing you've yeah, put around your tummy. Mm. No? It's, it's uh, not, something, not something you need, is it, uh, Lembert? You're very trim, but no, <laughs> it's not that. No. It is a mouth acoustic device. What, what does that mean? That you don't work with. Bethany, more detail. Like, yes. That's a said. Yeah. Do you put it in your mouth? Go, OK. <laughs> it's like a microphone. So essentially you're sort of hooked up to headphones and then you talk through the microphone. Actually, we can take a look in action. Wow. <laughs> I'm that's not just very unfashionable, no, no, I must. No. Oh, that's it's not going to last. Not a good look. <laughs> no, I think they've sold really him a pup. <laughs> yeah. I think my wife, Mrs. Dolan, would quite like me to wear <laughs> one of those when I'm at home, I'll be honest with you. Brilliant stuff. Uh, well done. A reasonable performance there. But you didn't get any of them right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, reasonable. Itch. Oh, that's right. It's a hush me. That's what it's called. It wraps around your face to stop people overhearing your secret phone calls. No. But you should expect no. strange secret. looks at the Pretty same time. obvious. It's like in the Premier League. It's a secret. Yes. You need to see that football secret managers do this. Phone call. Yeah. Just yeah. Like, I want to be a bit more subtle. Secret. I don't have any secrets. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. More's the pity. Now, Taliban fighters have been pictured brandishing RPGs and assault rifles whilst riding pedalos. Images appear to show militants riding swan-themed vessels <laughs> on the water at Bandamir National Park, once a hotspot for international travellers and domestic tourists. This in central Afghanistan. What a bizarre and dystopian image that is. Is it a coincidence that these light-hearted photos have surfaced as Afghanistan's new rulers face protests over their treatment of women and girls? Perhaps Alistair Campbell is their new spin doctor. <laughs> and this isn't the first time the Taliban have been spotted fooling around in a theme park. Here they are in August on the Dodgems. <laughs> this is remarkable stuff. You won't believe this. That's extraordinary. Look at that. <laughs> How embarrassing. So it's very strange. They'll go to Disneyland oh. next. Yeah. The world's gone mad. Yeah. And here they are pumping iron in the gym, or at least trying to get the hang of the machines. We're going to load that one. And they, uh, they, they made it into the uh, presidential palace, uh, which has its own subterranean gymnasium, uh, uh, gymnasium. And there they are. Is he running backwards? <laughs> it to be. That's another way of looking at this. Mm. This is because... They're not as weird as we make out. That's the other way of looking at it. They're real at human beings. Yeah, weird, yeah. Yeah. You could argue that the pedlo thing is just a special boat squad for the Taliban, but the reality is they're kind of probably more normal than we make out. Yeah, I've been well, through all this. When I was in Northern Ireland with mm. the peace process, the terrorists were presented as terrible ogres. Yeah. They were actually ordinary people who had done extraordinary, frightening things. Mm. But would you really put the Taliban in that category, given the way they treat women, the way they treat no, gay people? I wouldn't, but the point is that we, mm -hmm. no one is as great or as terrible as they made out in the media, mm -hmm. not even, dare I say it, Matt Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that, uh, or Toby Young, who's still all that time off the panel earlier on, <laughs> <laughs> he's a great, great contributor <laughs> today. But I, I just think this is an interesting point, and perhaps not what I expected to say. I would imagine you meet them, and they may have these extreme views, you can argue with them about it, but they're probably more normal than people make out. Mm, and my view is the best thing that's happened is people are talking to them. We've, the Americans have just spent two trillion pounds to be in a worse position than they yeah. were 20 years ago. Mm. And so in my judgment, you have to talk. So when do you think we should engage with the Taliban? Yeah, absolutely, definite, yeah. Because mm. when you engage, inevitably, and I've seen this 
in the most important stuff I've done in politics, people begin to moderate. They can't help it. They begin to moderate because they say, well, we don't really mean this or that. Mm. And like those pictures you've just been showing us there, they actually want to have fun. Now, you can say, these things that you're doing are terrible. Say, OK, well, let's discuss it. I think there's also another very important point to show about that, which is the um, age of these Taliban recruits. Mm. And in fact, they might not be men, but in fact, boys. And yes. so they're mm. still rather mature. We know that two thirds of the Afghani population is actually below the age of 25. Yeah. Mm. So most of these Taliban people are probably very young and this, you know, does excite them. And in one of those videos, mm. that exact one, the Dodge one, you can hear someone um, rather ominously giggling in the background. but. They are young, they're and just boys. And with that young population, you realise what potential there is in that country, and it's mm. therefore such a tragedy that it's in the hands, effectively, of gangsters. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, I take your point, Lembit, that, you know, they, in the end, what choice do we have but to engage with them? But yeah. I can't say I'm feeling overly optimistic. Just, I know, Jasmine, was coming, just this gangster's point. They may be extreme, mm. but this is a relative description. And my judgment, I've worked with extremists, I've seen extremists, I've negotiated with them. After the show, I want to make a, a suggestion about a very interesting debate I want to have with somebody who's regarded as an extremist. I just don't think they're as different to us as we make out, even if we totally disagree where, with us. Where do you draw culture. the line? I mean, are, are ISIS-K not extremists? Right. Yes. Well, all I can say is I think that we've exacerbated the situation because mm. after 20 years in the war on terror, you know that there are three times more people dying in terrorist events now mm. than they were in 2002. Well mm. Yeah, it's been about as successful as the war on drugs, hasn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. What, what, what I, I'm just wondering about those films, though, is they, they really do look like PR puffs. Somebody, it, it, I'm wondering... Yeah. Who's behind the camera? Why are they doing this? Why are they sending it out? Yeah. I'm trying to read it. Publicising it. I'm not quite sure. I mean, is it is it a, a hey, we're great guys. Honestly, we're really we're having normal. you know, Well, they have a cool. spokesperson and they're on Twitter. Oh, right. You know, and you could oh, argue right. that they have sort of manipulated the whole story brilliantly since they got in. Feels like it. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we've got basically Disneyland. So, you know, what's yeah. next? <laughs> but, but this is the point. They want to do this. They've put this out. There's, there is common ground. Yeah. And I think that's the way to solve this, or at least there you go. resolve aspects. Lembit Opic striking a conciliatory note. We're on the home straight very shortly. My panel will reveal their greatest Britain and Union jackass. Uh, with me are Letis Bromovsky, Lembit Opic and Jasmine Bertels. The Court of Appeal has said it was inappropriate for the High Court to issue guidance about children being prescribed puberty blockers without their parents' consent. A ruling issued last year said children under 16 considering gender reassignment are unlikely to be mature enough to give informed consent for the drugs, but it was successfully challenged by Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust, which runs NHS England's only gender identity development service for children. Liberty, which intervened in the appeal, called it a positive step forward for trans rights in the UK and around the world. Jasmine, your view on this, puberty blockers. I'm not in favour of it at all. I'm, I'm really not. I think that children, and they are children under, under 16, have not got the, the ability to decide what the situation is. Many of them are very unhappy. They might be gay. They might, all sorts of things. And to just go, it, you know, it, it's, it's like doctors just going, oh, something wrong with you, here's a pill. You know, mm. they, they do need a lot of support, a lot of help, a lot of talking. Um, and I'm, no, I'm, I'm not pro this at all. But. I mean, does this verdict surprise you, Lambert? A little bit. Uh, I'm roughly where Jasmine is on this. Two, two considerations. One is, and I don't know the answers, but I'll tell you what the questions are. At what point do you really know your sexuality? Because mm. mm. I don't think at 14 you're necessarily settled. Your hormones are all over the place. Mm. And people have episodes of thinking they may be gay and so on. And, and if you're put under a social pressure situation, potentially, you could make life-changing decisions mm. without your parents knowing. The second thing is, whatever the decision, the parents have to have some say, <laughs> even if at the end the individual makes a choice. So, so the one I, thing I don't know is when do you know your sexuality? And maybe there is an answer to that, but mm. I'm surprised by this. And I you see parallels mm. between your sexuality and your gender and how you identify. Yes, yes. Well, the, the clearly it's an attraction because it's about transsexuality. And we haven't got time to explain all the, all the subtleties, but yeah. being transgender is different to being straight or gay or, or, mm. or bisexual. Mm. Mm. But the decision, when you start blocking things in your body at that time, that's going to be with you for the rest of your yeah. life. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think, in fact, the great 
the great offence to me in, in sexuality in this country now is, is actually transgender people who, who are actually disrespected, often within the gay community, for example, yes. and so forth. I had some dealings with this sector um, uh, some years ago, and transsexual people are actually persecuted quite bad, really badly. But that's a different debate. At this point, parents have to be involved. And the really definitive question is, when do you actually know your sexuality? It's probably not mm. at 12. Well, Lettuce, uh, actually, trans, uh, many, many trans campaigners would say that it's cruel for somebody that's born in a boy's body, but that knows they're female, to, to force them to keep that designated gender. That, you know, if, 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 you, know if you are a girl, but you're in a boy's body, yeah. If you don't let these people have the treatment, then you're denying them that fundamental human right. Yeah, no, definitely. And that goes back to uh, what Jasmine said, that it's very mm. important that we do listen to them. But again, they're children and they are still forming their own thoughts, their own identity. Um, and I think a very important point here is that there is a lack of long-term medical data to mm. actually show the psychological impact this has on children or even the long-term side effects these drugs might have on children mm. as their bodies are still growing and forming. Mm. Interesting stuff. Uh, well, we're going to finish on a slightly more light-hearted story, but it's a hardy perennial in our household, which <laughs> is whether it's OK to pee in the shower. <laughs> a TikTok doctor has warned that the habit could cause incontinence because of the association with running water. In the video, which has over 29,000 likes, Dr. Alicia Jeffrey Thomas explains that women could face incontinence issues because they're not designed to pee standing up. Oh, my goodness. Well, weeing in the shower, <laughs> lettuce. Uh, I mean, this is I've, a very I mean, full disclosure, story. I've done it. <laughs> I have. <laughs> what? I'm going to admit. Uh, the I shame. Have the but what out. I don't do is I don't set out to wee in the shower, but occasionally you just might find yourself caught in, short. Yeah. Incontinence. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of that. It's better than weeing in the bath. Come on. I'm, yes. you know, well, that, that's my very view. odd, because then you have to sit in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not sure anyone would do that. So it's got to be better than weeing in the bath. Well, let's, uh, let's help get res this resolved here. Here's the TikTok clip. If you pee in the shower or turn on the faucet or turn on the shower and then sit in the toilet to pee while the water's running, you're creating an association in your brain between the sound of running water and having to pee. If we combo that with pelvic floor dysfunction either now or down the line, then that's going to potentially lead to some leak issues when you hear running water outside of the shower. So try to pee before you even ever turn on the shower water and if you get the urge while you're in the shower, try to ignore it. But it's always been the case that, that, I mean, everybody says, if you hear running water, you want to mm. wee. That's always, you know, from the start of time, surely. There are yes. 29,000 reasons she's made that video. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, this is an incredible coincidence. I actually supported a campaign by some students some years ago in favour of weeing in the shower to save water. Now, mm. I don't think, I'll, I'll leave that to say, she said something I agreed with uh, before we came on there. I don't think this is going to have a long-term association. Let me tell you that a man in Japan got in trouble with the authorities because he had a fetish with his girlfriends, which was to drive them around in his car, and he wouldn't let them get out if they needed a wee. That was a turn-on for him. And in the end, he had his collar felt, but that was a bizarre fetish in which Weird. he was turned on by his other half, desperately needing a wee. So there you go. <laughs> it takes all sorts, doesn't it? <laughs> You can understand why we waited till late in the program for that conversation. <laughs> Time now for this. <laughs> well, we're going to rattle through our Greatest Britain and Union Jackass as nominated by my panel. So, Jasmine, your Greatest Britain. It's going to be Emma Raducanu. I know that's boring. I'm sure everybody else has done it, but I'm afraid it is her. Can't yes. argue. No, you and can't. And she's so graceful. Yes. And uh, she's already, you know, the interviews have been really fascinating. She's yes. not made any gaffes. No, She's good for her. She's very mature for her age. Yeah, yeah good Completely for her. Completely agree. How about your greatest Britain? Scott Morrison, the mm. Prime Minister. ScoMo. Yeah. Prime Minister of Australia. Of Australia for saying, uh, I won't do his accent, <laughs> it's going to be Australia, it's going to be Australia. Um, <laughs> United Kingdom and the USA building the nuclear subs for their Pacific fleet, not France. It's made <laughs> France go mental. Well done, Scott Morrison. He still remembers the Commonwealth. Yeah, it's <laughs> going or, 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 or that guy down under is the president yeah. of the Ameri actually, America. He actually pushed it even further. He actually said, well, I, I warned the, Australia, uh, the French they may not be up to this. And he's it, been really pretty direct to the French. So fair play. He hasn't been bullied for the 37 billion euro contract the French have just lost. Absolutely too right. How about you, Lettice, your um, greatest Britain? Mine today is going to be Rosie Duffield, the Labour MP, yeah. um, because I'm absolutely appalled 
at the way that she's been treated for essentially uh, free speech. You know, we have hired MPs to give their opinions on things and that she had an opinion on it and now she's getting death threats and she can't actually attend the Labour conference um, next week. So No, and Laura Kunzberg needed security a few years ago it, at exactly. Labour conference. And this it's is... not a good look for the Labour no, movement, is um, it? And it's also highlighting a greater issue of violence against women that we're seeing um, and hopefully that that will be something dealt with. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant stuff. How about your union jackass? Uh, my union jackass on the same wave as Lembet here is um, the French foreign minister, <laughs> Le Trian, um, <laughs> after he not only, I think, gave a knee-jerk reaction removing his ambassadors from both the USA um, and Australia, but also the pettiness that um, France expressed when saying that they wouldn't remove them from the UK purely because um, they did, they thought the UK was a junior player in the pact. And, Ouch. Um, yes, <laughs> very petty, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. <laughs> Too right. Lembit. For me, it's the COVID testing regime when mm. you travelled into the UK. You know what? If you actually leave the UK for a couple of days, you can actually use the test that you got before you left the UK to get back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain right. the logic. They've yeah. managed to wreck the travel industry. Doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah, too yeah. right. Uh, good shout. How about you? Your union jackass. Well, you preempted me. It, it has to be Matt Hancock. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> just, <laughs> just, I'm not happy with him at all. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, too right. Uh, well, listen, thank you to my amazing panel. It's been a brilliant conversation tonight.